What's up y'all, welcome back to Fish the Moment. In this video, I'm going to explain how to catch suspended bass offshore on a swim bait. Let's get into it. Okay guys, fall is almost here, and that means that a lot of bass are gonna start their migration from the main lake back into the creeks, and they're gonna follow big schools of shad. When they do this, a lot of these bass are gonna be suspended around offshore structure and out in the middle of the creeks. This makes them very difficult to catch with your traditional power fishing techniques, but it makes them actually really susceptible to a swim bait. This is actually one of my favorite ways to catch fish in the fall, and if you're fishing any time from about September through November, you should be able to find a swim bait bite for suspended bass. Now, fishing a swim bait for suspended bass is definitely one of the more advanced techniques in bass fishing. There's not a lot of great information out there. I had to learn through trial and error over 10 years to really dial in how to fish a swim bait in the middle of the water column and trigger those fish to bite. Fortunately, I figured it out about three years ago and I feel like I'm an expert on it at this point. So I'm going to explain in this video the entire process of fishing a swim bait, how to identify fish on your fish finder, how to count down the bait, how to reel it in, everything you need to know so that you can be an expert at offshore swim bait fishing in the fall as well. So let's get into it. First, let's explain what a suspended bass is. Basically, it's a fish that's not related to the bottom or the surface of the water. They're in that in-between zone. A lot of times bass will suspend just randomly out in the middle and follow big schools of bait fish around. Other times they'll suspend over the top of a structure, like a ledge, a hump, or a point. Other times they'll suspend by cover, like a brush pile, a rock pile, or standing timber. In all these cases, these fish are basically just roaming around chasing bait fish, but some of these fish are more easy to catch than others. And let me explain how that works. In general, the toughest type of suspended bass to catch are the fish that are sitting out over the creek channel, over the deepest part of the lake, just randomly chasing bait. These fish are not related to any structure or cover, and they are very migratory. They move a lot, or nomadic. This makes them really challenging to pin down, and even if you graph these fish with electronics, if you try to spin around and cast on those fish, there's a really good chance that they've already swam 15, 20 yards away from where you initially graphed them. And if you regraph over that area, a lot of times they're gone. This makes these fish pretty much like ghost fish. And I actually don't target these fish very often. There are a few times in the winter that I will fish for these fish. And I'll talk about that later this year. But in the fall, I don't really worry about trying to chase these fish. They're just randomly out in the middle. The only time I really can catch those fish is when they actually come to the surface and start schooling on the surface. And if you get there really quickly, you can throw a top water on them and catch them. But other than that, I really just leave those group of fish alone. And instead, I focus on fish that are related to either some structure or cover. In terms of these two types of fish, the easiest type of suspended bass to catch are the bass that are positioned around some sort of cover, whether that's a standing tree, a brush pile, a rock pile, some sort of cover out in the middle of the lake. The reason these fish are the easiest to catch is because they're actually related to a piece of cover and they're using that cover to ambush bait fish that come by. This means that they're not going to be migratory and they're not going to be swimming around out in the middle of the lake. They're actually going to be locked on a specific target. This is really important because after you graph over these fish, you can actually spin your boat back around, cast at the waypoint that you just made, and those fish will still be there. Again, when you're out looking for fish in the middle of the lake, those fish can move 20, 30 yards every couple of minutes, which means that by the time you actually cast on them, they're gone. But when those fish are related to a tree or a rock or a brush pile, they'll usually stay there for maybe a whole day or at least for a couple hours, and that allows you to pinpoint your cast and get that bait right in front of those fish, which is the key to catching suspended bass. Now there are a lot of different types of cover that these bass will suspend around, and here are just some examples of suspended bass that I've graphed in the past. Sometimes they'll get around big boulders or rocks, and they'll suspend five to 10 feet off the rocks, but they won't be all the way up by the surface, they'll kind of be in the middle of the water column. Sometimes you can find them suspended over the top of standing timber, or they'll actually be in the center of a tree, halfway down the tree, and they won't actually be on top of it, they'll be right in the center of it. And then other times you can find fish suspended over the top of brush piles and cane piles that are man-made that people put in the middle of the lake. It doesn't really matter what type of cover these fish are related to, the way you fish for them is all the same, but again, the key is that because they're related to some sort of cover, they will stay put and you can actually put your bait in front of them consistently. The last type of fish are the bass that are suspended around structure. And these fish are a little bit more hit or miss whether you can actually catch them. A lot of times you'll find fish suspended off the tip of a point or maybe right off the lip of a ledge or over the top of a hump. 
And if there isn't any sort of cover there, like rocks, brush, wood, things like that, a lot of times these fish will move and roam a little bit more because they don't have an ambush point to relate to. However, sometimes they'll actually use the structure itself as their ambush point. For example, if you find some fish suspended over the creek channel but by the lip of a ledge, these fish are catchable a lot of times because they're using that ledge to ambush bait fish up on top of the shallower water area. They'll kind of hide in the shadow of that ledge and then pop out and eat those fish or the bait fish. Therefore, there are situations where the structure can actually become a cover for the bass and become an ambush point. And the only way you're going to know this is just through experience and a lot of times trial and error to see if those fish are staying put. One easy recommendation to test this is after you graph over a group of fish that you see suspended on your graph, mark a waypoint, spin your boat back around, graph over them again, right over the exact waypoint you just graphed. If those fish are still there, spin back around a third time, graph over them, and if they're still there after your third pass, then those fish are definitely locked in on the area and they're catchable. Now, sometimes it can actually spook the fish and kind of cause them to swim away, which isn't great, but if it's a really good offshore spot and and those fish are locked in on that cover, even if you graph over them three times, it won't affect him, especially if you're in a deeper, clearer lake. If you're in a shallow or dirty water lake, again, you can still graph over them several times, but fish have a less tendency to suspend in dirty water than clear water, so it's kind of all up to interpretation. I'm not gonna be able to give you guys all the answers, but hopefully this all makes sense. Next, let's talk about how you actually fish a swim bait for these bass. Again, one of the keys is the ability to graph over these fish, mark them with a waypoint or maybe a marker buoy, and then make a cast directly on them. If you don't know how to do this, I've made a video specifically focused on how to hit a piece of offshore structure that you mark on your graph with every single cast. It's one of my best videos. You need to check it out. If you haven't seen it, it is a must watch. So check out that video after this one if you wanna learn how to hit pinpoint spots that you graph offshore. Now, assuming you have the ability to mark that spot, cast to them, and then feel like you're putting your bait in front of those fish, the next thing is you have to determine how deep those fish are in the water column. A lot of times these bass will suspend at different depths. They can suspend five feet under the surface, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet at some times. And you have to be able to gauge where those fish are sitting in the water column to know how to fish your swim bait for those fish. Basically what I'll do is just look at the graph, see where the majority of those fish are sitting in the water level or depth that they're in. And what I'm gonna to try to do is actually cast my swim bait, let it sink down to the level of those fish and then reel it through those fish. Again, if you aren't finding these fish your electronics and you don't know what depth they're at, it's very difficult to catch these suspended bass. You really need to bring this bait pretty close to those fish for them to actually react to it. Now, one thing that's really important to note is that most fish that are suspended offshore actually feed upwards. This means that you don't want to bring your bait below the level of the fish. Let's say you're suspended in 15 feet of water. You want to bring that bait over the top of those fish, so maybe let your bait sink down to 10 feet and reel it over the top of them, as opposed to letting it sink below those fish into 20 foot of water. If that bait sinks below the level of those fish, a lot of times they're just not going to react to it or they're not gonna eat it. But if you bring it over the top of their heads, they'll come up and eat that swim bait as it's swimming over the top of them. Therefore, knowing the level that those fish are at is really important, and then knowing that you need to basically keep your bait about a foot to five feet above their head is crucial to catching a lot of fish offshore they're suspended. After that, we actually have to get the swim bait down to those fish. What I'll basically do, I'll have my waypoint on the graph, I'll know where those fish are, I'm going to cast my swim bait out, and I'm going to count it down to the depth of those fish. Now, counting down a swim bait can be very tricky because every swim bait head, swim bait style, the weights, everything like that, will have a different fall rate, and you'll have to let them fall for a different amount of time to keep them in the depth zone you want. Also, you have to match the speed at which you're reeling your reel to the head size that you're using to keep that bait at the same level of those fish, which can be very, very tricky, and it takes a lot of experimentation to figure out. In general, I prefer to use anywhere from a 3 8 ounce to a half ounce jig head when I'm throwing my smaller swim baits, let's say three to four inch swim baits. And I'll use a heavier head, let's say a three quarter ounce or a one ounce when I'm using bigger five and six inch swim baits. The reason for this is because your smaller swim baits have a smaller boot tail and therefore, they're not going to produce as much drag as they fall. And so a half ounce head or a three eighths ounce head will allow these swim baits to fall like a foot to maybe two feet a second. 
However, if you use a three eighths ounce head and a six inch swim bait, a lot of times that six inch swim bait will have a really big paddle tail and that three eighths ounce head will cause that bait to fall super slow. It'll fall like half a foot a second, maybe a foot a second at the most, which will take forever to get down to those deep fish and you're going to be wasting a lot of time being inefficient. Therefore, my go-to is a half ounce head with my four inch and three inch swim baits and then a one ounce head with my five and six inch swim baits. I'll get into the swim baits I use here in a second, but let's finish up this topic of how to actually fish these baits before we get into all the baits. Now another thing you may be wondering is how you know what the fall rate of your bait is. Basically what I'll do is I will measure out the length of a rod. This rod is seven foot two inches long and I'm going to put my bait near the base of my rod. So I basically have seven feet of line out between the tip of my rod and my bait. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this bait and drop it in the water on slack line and count how long it takes for the line to go from slack to go tight. So basically that you can feel the resistance against the tip of your rod. What that'll do is it will let me know how long it takes this bait to fall seven feet. So let's say I drop this bait in the water and it falls seven feet in three, three and a half seconds. That means this bait is falling at two feet per second. If it takes seven seconds to fall seven feet, it's now falling at a foot per second. Then, knowing this information, I can cast my swim bait out, and depending on how deep I want to get my bait to, I know the fall rate, and I can adjust my count to what the fall rate is. So for example, if I want this bait to get down to 14 feet, and it falls at a rate of two feet per second, I just need to cast it out and let it sink for seven seconds to get it to the depth range, then I'll engage my reel and start reeling it in. Now, if the bait falls at a foot per second, then I'm gonna have to let it sink for 14 seconds to get down to 14 feet of water. And you can adjust this based on the depth you wanna to get to and the fall rate of your bait. Not really that complicated at the end of the day. It just takes a little bit of extra preparation, a little bit of extra thought. Now, the trickier thing is actually keeping that bait in the depth zone that you want it in. And again, in general, you wanna be fishing these swim baits over the top of the head of the fish. So one thing you want to resist is the temptation to fish your swim baits at a snail's pace, fishing it really, really slow. Because a lot of times these swim baits will actually fall below the level of the fish, and you're not gonna get any bites. At the same time, you don't wanna reel these baits too fast. It's not like you're gonna cast it out and reel it in like you would reel a chatter bait or a spinner bait. If you do that, this bait's going to rise up very quickly to the surface of the water and you're not going to get any bites. Therefore, we really need to use a steady, just medium retrieve, maybe a slow to medium retrieve, very methodical. You can see in some of these clips of my chest camera how I'm reeling that swim bait. It's not a super slow retrieve, but it's also not a very quick retrieve. This will keep that bait from falling down in the water column, but it will also maybe only cause it to rise up just a little bit. Again, you wanna air more on the side of that bait rising up in the water column than falling down in the water column, because at some point you might find that bait gets below those fish, you're not getting any bites. One thing I'll also do is if I feel like I'm not getting that bait to the level of those fish, or if I'm reeling it a little bit too, little bit too quickly, halfway through my reel or my retrieve, I'll actually stop reeling for like three or four seconds, let that bait fall maybe four or five seconds or three seconds and then keep reeling again. And sometimes I might burn the reel handle and let it sink and fall. I'm not always just doing a straight steady retrieve with this bait, but in general, I'm keeping it that medium slow retrieve so that I keep it deep, but I'm also not letting it go below the level of the fish. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a little bit hard to explain without being on the water with you, but hopefully from the recordings here, you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. In terms of the specific swim baits, as well as the heads and equipment I use, there are so many different options that can be overwhelming. One of the most popular brands of swim baits is the Kitek Swing Impact Fat Swim Bait. If you've tried to fish a swim bait before, you've probably picked up a pack of these. They're pretty much everywhere. They are the most popular style of swim bait, and they've been copied by a lot of other brands. So if you haven't thrown the Kitek, you've probably thrown the Strike King, Bass Pro Shops, Guggen Squad, everyone has one of these. And because of that, I've actually stopped throwing these because I believe these fish have become conditioned to this body shape. Will they still work? Obviously, for sure. But if I'm fishing offshore areas, and I know other guys are fishing them as well, chances are if they're throwing a swim bait, they're throwing this body shape. As a result, I don't want to be throwing this bait because I want to give myself an advantage and throw through something different. Therefore, I started going to the Mega Bass Spark Shad series of swim baits. I started throwing these about maybe a year, year and a half ago. I found them at the local tackle shop, and I've been really impressed with them. They pretty much come at the exact same price point as the Kitek, 
they're just harder to find basically. They only are in specialty tackle shops or you can get them online at Tackle Warehouse. Links in the description below. And they come in three really good sizes. You have the three inch spark shad, which is great for those small finesse jig heads, especially like in the winter and the fall. You see me catch a lot of fish on these in videos. The four inch mega bass spark shad is kind of my go-to size that works really well in pretty much all conditions. And then the five inch spark shad is great when you want to get a bigger profile bait with bigger gizzard shad or if you want fish like an offshore ledge. Basically, those three sizes cover 90% of what I would need to do swim bait fishing. And again, the price point's good, so this is what I use. I literally only carry spark shads in my boat now when I'm fishing offshore swim baits. The only exception is actually, I've been experimenting with the Mega Bass Mag Draft Freestyle swim bait as well. Now, I've been throwing this to replace the standard hollow body swim baits that have been really popular on the Tennessee River and just all over the country for years. I still catch a lot of fish on hollow belly swim baits in my area because a lot of guys don't throw them still, but I found that I can get some really good bites fishing this Mag Draft Freestyle swim bait on a big jig head offshore on ledges and points and things like that. This bait is a little bit pricier, and so I wouldn't expect everyone to want to pick these up and throw them. I've just had a lot of success with them, so I, this is what I use. You can still throw a hollow belly swim bait as well, but this is what I've been going with recently and has some good results on it. In terms of the colors of my spark shads, I keep it super simple. I basically carry some sort of shad pattern. Good colors are the silver shad, the real color. There's a bunch of different colors they are good, but it doesn't really matter to me that much. I just pick something that's kind of a natural shad pattern. And then I also like something that's a little bit brighter, like a white or maybe this a little bit brighter blue colored swim bait. Again, the color to me doesn't matter nearly as much. I'll go with the white colors and the brighter blue in that dirtier water, and then the more natural greens and muted shad patterns in the clear water. So as you can see, my swim bait selection is pretty simple. I basically carry four body styles in two different colors in each of those body styles, which means I don't have to load the boat with swim baits, which is great since I don't have an 18 foot boat. But unfortunately, my jig head selection is a lot more complicated than my swim bait selection and I spend a lot of time experimenting with different jig heads, things like that, to make sure that I'm getting the best action and the best results out of these swim baits. Let's start by talking about jig heads for the 4 inch spark shad. That's kind of my go-to size when I start fishing for suspended bass offshore with a swim bait. My go-to head for this bait recently has been the Mega Bass Body Balance Head. It's kind of a unique design. I picked them up at the store along with the spark chads, and I've really fallen in love with them. What this head does is actually put some weight underneath the head of the swim bait. And I didn't really know why this mattered until I actually took some swim baits to an Olympic sized swimming pool and started testing them underwater. And what I found is that when I was reeling in these swim baits, a lot of these swim baits are, would swim head up, especially when fishing them in deep water. This means that the bait kind of almost swims with like the tail down, point towards the water, and the head towards the surface, and it looks a little bit unnatural. But this body balance head will actually weight that bait properly and make it swim through the water on a more level plane, which I believe is a little more natural to the bass. Now, I'm not gonna say this adds a ton of extra fish in the boat, but I'm a believer and so I've been throwing them and I really like them. It gives me extra confidence if anything, especially when I'm fishing a swim bait in the middle of the water column in super clear water. Any extra confidence I can get is really important. Now one call out with these jig heads is they are not cheap. They're like $5 a jig head, which seems really pricey, but for the technology, I believe it's worth it. And I don't throw this jig head around cover. Like I never throw this around trees or brush piles or anything like that because well, I just don't want to lose them. I don't want to spend five bucks on jig heads. So what I do instead when I'm fishing around sanding timber and brush piles is fish the Jewel Bait Company Gem Shad head. This is just a Gem Shad swim bait head. It has a wire keeper guard on it. It has a really short stout hook, which is really important, especially when you're fishing a swim bait because the shorter your hook is, the better that bait is going to be able to move side to side. I don't like a hook that's too long that goes too far into the body of the bait because it restricts the motion of that swim bait tail. Therefore, this gem shad hook is the perfect solution for that. On top of it, you have that nice cable guard that's similar to the one that's in the Fish the Moment offshore jig, which helps it come through brush and sanding timber really well. And I don't have to worry about losing or getting hung up with my swim baits. So again, I'll throw this around timber and I'll throw that body balance head, this one right here, when I am 
trying to fish open water and I know I'm not gonna get hung up. In terms of the weight for these heads, I like to fish in the body balance head, the 3 8 ounce size. Whenever I'm fishing for bass, they're suspended between 10 to 20 feet of water. That 3 8 ounce size allows me to fish it at a steady pace down there, but it doesn't go too deep and I'll drill it too fast. And then if I'm fishing deeper than that, in that 20 to 30 foot range, I'll actually go to the half ounce size head, just because it will get that bait down there deeper. And if you fish a three quarter or a three eighths ounce jig head in 20, 25 feet of water, you have to reel that reel handle so slow to keep it down in the strike zone that it's just kind of a pain in the butt. Therefore, the half ounce head is a little bit better when you want to fish it really deep. And I'll also throw the half ounce head if I really want to get a reaction strike out of those fish. If I feel like they're aggressive and they're feeding, I'll throw the half ounce head when the fish are suspended 10 to 12 feet down because I can reel it faster and keep it moving and maybe burn it and stop it and you can trigger some better reaction strikes. And that's in the body balance head. And then in the gem shad head by Jewel, this only comes in a quarter ounce size, so it's not going to be as heavy, but that's actually really good because you don't want this bait to be like digging down into the cover. So I prefer that little quarter ounce head. I usually will throw this on, sometimes on spinning tackle, but I'll also throw it on a bait caster like 10 pound fluorocarbon. And you'll have to fish it somewhat slow and do more of like kind of a burn and stop retrieve with this. But the advantage of having the cable guard in there is that you're not gonna get hung up and it's not heavy, so heavy that it's gonna dig down those trees. So really good design there on that head. The only other head that I might throw on this four inch uh, spark shad is I'll sometimes throw an underspin head. And really the only time I throw the underspin is if I'm catching a bunch of fish on the regular heads like the gem shad or the body balance head for mega bass and I'm just getting some bites and maybe I feel like they're getting conditioned to this profile or this flash of the bait. And if I am starting to see a decline in bites, I'll always have a underspin in the boat and I'll throw it up there just to see if I can trigger one extra bite or two. And there's a bunch of different brands on the market. I don't have one in particular I throw. I have like the Strike King one is this one. I have no idea what brand this one is, honestly. It might be like the Fish Head Spin one. And then there's also a Gem Shad with a underspin on it. So I have a bunch of different underspins. I don't throw them that much to be honest. I probably need to experiment with them more, but it's definitely something I'll have in the boat just in case. Next up, let's talk about how I rig this five inch Mega Bass Spark Shad. This five inch Spark Shad is pretty beefy, pretty big, and I really only throw it when I know the bass are feeding on bigger bait, whether that's bigger gizzard shad, or I know if there's like really big, you know, four and five inch thread fin shad in the area. When I'm fishing this bait, it's usually going to be in slightly off color water and I'm fishing it less than 20 feet of water, just in general. That's not the rule, like the rule, but that's at least kind of a guideline that I use. When I'm fishing this bait, I really like to throw it with the True Bass three quarter ounce screw lock jig head. It is a really nice jig head. It has that screw lock which holds this bait in place really well. I really enjoy this head and that three quarter ounce is perfect with this spark shad because you can keep it down there in that 10 to 15 foot of water pretty easily, reel it pretty fast, and you don't really need to go much heavier than that with this five inch bait. The tail doesn't pull a ton of water, move a lot of water, so it's not like you're gonna have a slow fall on it. It'll fall pretty quick with that three quarter ounce head, and I've caught a lot of good fish this summer on this exact rig right here. And that's really the only thing I throw the five inch spark shad on. I don't throw the five inch that often, I actually found that I'm throwing the Magdraft Freestyle in the six inch size more than I'm throwing that five inch spark shed, at least during the summertime. I haven't experimented with the five inch as much in the fall, so we'll kind of see how that goes. But with this six inch Magdraft Freestyle, it's a really beefy bait. And I'll throw this on a one ounce Picasso or a one and a quarter ounce Picasso jig head. It has a nice stout hook on it, but it doesn't go again too far down in the body of that bait, so I still have a lot of good tail action from that swim bait. The one ounce head is really important because this bait has a pretty big tail on it, which will cause a lot of drag in the water, and it will fall kind of slow. If I'm trying to fish it down, let's say in 15 foot of water, I'll go to the one ounce set head. If I want to fish it down there in that 20 foot range, I'll go to the ounce and a quarter size with this swim bait head, just to make sure it's down there on the bottom. 
I'll sometimes burn it and stop it. I'll talk about retrieves and stuff here if I haven't already in this video. And that's really important when you're fishing a swim bait is to get a head size that will allow you to keep that bait down in the water column where you want the bait to be and be able to fish it fast and slow. If you throw a half ounce head with this big mag draft swim bait, it's not going to fall down to that 10 to 15 foot zone very easily. And as soon as you start reeling it, it's gonna rise up out of that strike zone away from the bass. So experimenting with the weight of your head is really important. You can go with the guidelines I have here because I've experimented with this for literally like hundreds of hours to get these correct swim bait sizes with these heads. And these similar head sizes work with similar size swim baits like the Kai Tech, things like that too. So it's not just specific to the spark shads, but if you want the exact setup, you can obviously just use what I'm using, but it doesn't have to be exactly what I'm using. In terms of my setup when I'm throwing this four inch spark shad, I like to throw a 7 foot 2 medium heavy action quantum smoke S3 rod with 12 pound or 10 pound fluorocarbon line. I cannot stress enough the importance of throwing lighter line with these swim baits. It really helps keep that bait down the wire column and gives them better action. I never go over 12 pound test with this 4 inch bait because it will overwhelm this bait and really kill the action. And as always, I'm throwing my Abu Garcia Black Max Reel, 6 4 to 1 gear ratio reel. So that's my setup with all those different 4 inch spark shad heads. In terms of my equipment, when I'm fishing the 5 inch spark shad or that 6 inch mag draft freestyle, I like to throw it on a 7 foot 6 heavy action quantum smoke S3 rod, basically a flipping stick with 15 pound fluorocarbon line. I find that with those heavier heads, that three quarter ounce, that one ounce head, you can get away with 15 pound test, no problem. That's as heavy as I'll go, and I sometimes will even go back down to 12 pound test if I feel like those fish are a little bit line shy. But I would say it only happens like 10% of the time. I pretty much stick with 15 and you're good to go. And again, with a Abu Garcia Black Max, $49 reel. I'm telling you guys, these things are good. I keep talking about them and people just don't believe me. Just go get them, they're, they're great. But really quick guys, if you enjoy this video and want to support more content from Fish the Moment, one easy and free way to do that is by going to my website, fishthemoment.com, then going to the Support Fish the Moment tab at the top of the screen. This will take you to a page with a couple different ways to support my channel, and one of those is my Tackle Warehouse affiliate link. All you have to do is click on this link, it'll take you straight to Tackle Warehouse, and then if you check out on Tackle Warehouse using that link, I'll get a small percentage of the profits from any purchases you make. And the way this works basically is that there's a little tag at the end of the Tackle Warehouse URL, question mark from equals fish the moment. And anytime you use that link, they'll know that I sent you to the website. And so one way to make sure you always use this link when you shop at Tackle Warehouse is just to bookmark the page and add that to your bookmarks bar. That way, anytime you go to Tackle Warehouse from that bookmark link, you'll be taken straight to Tackle Warehouse using my link, and I'll always get credit for all your purchases. So if you do like the content on my YouTube channel and want to support me further, this is a really easy and free way to do it, and I really appreciate you guys taking a few minutes to do that. Last but not least is the 3 Spark Shad. It's my favorite in the lineup. It's actually the first one I picked up and started throwing, and it got me to use all the other baits as well, and I caught hundreds of bass on this bait. Basically my setup for it is, I'll throw it on a quarter ounce ball head, just a little tiny jig head. You can barely see it in the camera here. It's really small. And really this jig head has a finesse hook that's perfect for this swim bait. I'll use two different uh, jig heads. One is by Owner and then one is by 4x4 Tackle. I'll link both of them in the description below. It's really key to use one of these two jig heads because they have a really small, number two hook, or it's maybe a two-aught hook in this jig head, which is perfect to make sure that that bait still has room to move, that tail has room to move. If you have a jig head that's too big for this bait, it will overwhelm the bait and you will not be able to get bites on this. It will just kill the action completely. And again, it all mainly comes down to the hook size, not so much the head size. The quarter ounce for me works really well when I'm fishing in that you know, 20 to 30 foot range, especially in the pre-spawn in the winter. But I will go lighter, it's like a 3 16 or even an eighth ounce, depending on where those fish are positioned. And really what I'm doing when I'm fishing this bait is just casting it out on offshore areas and just slowly winding it in. You have to reel this bait as slow as you possibly can to keep it down there, because it's only a quarter ounce head. And to make that a little bit easier, I'm throwing it with six pound fluorocarbon on a spinning rod. So I'll use a 
fluorocarbon leader with a 10 pound braided line main line. And I'm throwing that a seven foot two medium light action quantum smoke S3 rod. I'm trying to make long casts with this bait, get it down deep and just slowly wind it in. It's a great approach, especially in the colder months to put a ton of fish in the boat. Now in the warmer months, I'll actually get away from that heavier head and go to a little bit lighter head. And this is one that a lot of people are talking about and that I didn't start throwing until I actually saw Chris Seldane catch him on a local lake here in Oklahoma on 10 Killer Lake during a Bassmaster Elite Series event. And that's the Okashira Spin Head. It's an eighth ounce head, it's really, really light. It has, the, again, the perfect size hook to give that bait a lot of action. And it's a very light head, so you can't really fish it on heavy equipment. Again, six pound fluorocarbon. I actually have this reel as six pound straight fluorocarbon because this is also my spy bait setup. And it's a seven foot medium moderate, kind of a very light action. Can't see the action. There you go. There you go, light action. I probably look ridiculous doing that. Light action spinning rod. And the reason for that is because this bait is so light, you have to have a pretty whippy rod to be able to cast it. And I'll throw this thing for suspended bass in the summertime, especially when they're setting up high in the water column, early in the day, late in the afternoons, and then in the fall. And whenever those fish are positioned, let's say zero to 10 feet from the surface, this little Okashira spin head is the way to go. So that's another little setup I throw with that three inch spark shad. And that basically covers all of the swim bait options. I carry, again, several different head shapes. I carry four body styles of swim baits. And for me, that just really helps me standardize the fall rate of my baits. I know exactly how I can work the baits to make sure I don't overwork them or underwork them. And I would highly recommend just picking one brand of swim bait and just kind of going with it because you can learn that bait in and out and it is such a feel technique. You have to really get in tune with those baits that if you're trying to throw six different brands of swim baits, it's probably not gonna work out as well. You can obviously catch them, but not be my recommendation. And I would recommend these spark shads if you can pick them on, up on Tackle Warehouse and stuff like that, or you have them at a local tackle shop, because they do really work. So that's the equipment. Now let's get into some other aspects of this offshore swim bait fishing. Last but not least, let's talk about the types of areas that throw swim baits in. In general, I'm throwing these swim baits on offshore structure where I can find suspended baths in my graph. This means I'm looking around humps, points, creek channels, ditches, ledges, all of the buzzwords of different types of structure. I have a video that explains all these different types of structure on a contour line map if you don't know what I'm talking about. And really what I'm gonna do is just graph around on these pieces of offshore structure, both in the main lake as well as halfway back in the creeks. Again, in the fall, a lot of these bass are gonna be migrating from the main lake back in the creeks following the shad. This means that the shad will set up on different types of offshore structure from the main lake all the way to the very backs of the creeks. Sometimes you can find fish suspended even on like shallower points that are halfway back or three quarters of the way back in your creeks, especially if it's a little bit steeper creek over trees and rocks and stuff like that. Therefore, really it takes a lot of graphing to find these fish because they will be very spread out. They will be suspended and moving around a lot. You're not going to be able to go day to day and probably find fish on the exact same spots over and over again. You may have to relocate these fish every time you go to the lake, which can make it also a little bit challenging for new anglers who maybe aren't as good at locating fish on their electronics or finding and duplicating patterns. But usually the swim bait bite is a patternable approach. You can replicate what these fish are doing on different parts of your lake. This means that if you find fish suspended over standing timber on points halfway back in a creek, you can go to every single creek in that section of the lake and find fish suspended in those same areas. They all kind of migrate together in those same sections of the lake and you can usually run a good pattern and catch a lot of fish this way. In conclusion, fishing a swim bait for suspended bass is definitely an advanced bass fishing technique. It takes a lot of preparation, a lot of skill with your electronics and mapping, as well as a lot of attention to detail with your baits and techniques to put fish in the boat. I would highly recommend giving this approach a chance in the fall, and I wouldn't expect to go out and catch them first time you do this. It's going to take a lot of trial and error. You're going to have some frustrating days, but if you are serious about bass fishing and you really want to dial in 
on your fall fishing to put fish in the boat consistently, catching fish on a suspended swim bait is one of the best ways to catch them. Hopefully this video is helpful to you guys. Hopefully you learned something. If you enjoyed, leave a comment down below and let me know what you thought. And other than that, um, just thanks for checking out the video. We'll be coming back with a lot more content here and I'll be doing probably a lot of on the water fishing with swim baits so you'll be able to see the results as well in videos coming up very shortly. So thanks again for checking out the video and I'll see you all next one.